Leslie's husband um, went to heaven just over four years ago. She was part, he, uh, we actually had our life group meeting at their home. Um, and that last year, especially those last few months, there was some times where our life group met around Jeff's bed and um, allowed him to be a part of our life group experience even though he was at a place where it was, well, his energy was draining away. Um, I've asked Leslie to share this morning because what, what God says in the text that we're looking at today is, is that the God of compassion, the Father of comfort, comforts us so that we can comfort one another. I've watched Leslie from the days, I remember that, and I warned you, I was going to set you up. <laughs> I remember the day she sat out here in the parking lot when she had just learned about the cancer that was ravaging through his body. And she knew that day. She knew that day that um, Jeff was going to be leaving soon. She didn't know how long, but she knew it. And um, I've watched her as she's dealt with that pain and as she's ministered to many other people because of her pain. We serve an incredible God Amen. who is able to comfort us so that we can comfort one another. I'd like you to hear a little bit of Leslie's story and how God has carried and comforted her through grief. God bless you. I love you. <laughs> Four pages. Yeah. So sit back. There might not be a sermon this morning. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say that we're all grieving, as Pastor said earlier on, and is welcome. Um, and this isn't just about my grief, um, but it's about all of our grief. You know, all of creation is grieving. All of creation. And I ask you to ponder and really think about that sometime. And you're talking about all of it. The plants, the trees, the dogs, the cats, men, women, children, all of creation. The mountains cry out. Um, and we've been grieving ever since the day we were born. And we came out of our mother's wombs wailing. And we've been wailing ever since. And, um, and there's different kinds of grief, as you know. I mean, someone can die. You know, you, there's regrets. Um, the loss of parents. The loss of not having a parent. The loss of not having a good parent. There's abuse. There's mental and physical. Our hearts have been hurting badly since we came out of the womb. But without love, there is no grief. And without grief, there's no love. How would you do one without the other? And I ask you to, you know, really think on that and ponder that. Um, as you continue to grieve the rest of your life until the day you die, even in death, you grieve those you leave behind because you know you're going home to see Jesus, and you're really sorry they're not. And there's a grief in that as well. Five days before Christmas, I'm going to read some of this, if it's okay with you guys. Um, five days before Christmas, just over four years ago, um, Jeff died. A couple of days ago um, was the anniversary of my mother's death. And she'd been gone a year now. This coming Tuesday, it'll be 31 years since my niece was killed by a drunk driver. And the list goes on and on. I mean, you can go into all the other griefs, but I, I think what I'm trying to say is that we're all grieving, and I do understand that it comes in different ways. If it's your choice to stuff the grief away and be tough or walk away from God or turn to an addiction of any kind or become bitter, Caught in an unhealthy need for attention, using manipulation, greed, gossip, and dissension. Make no mistake about it. 
you cannot avoid a grieving process. You must go through the process. The grieving process will have it. It demands it. So when I say that we've been grieving since we've been born, we have been. And through all that time, until something comes along, like for me, when Jeff passed away, I don't think I realized to what depth I had been grieving a lot of the mistakes and choices I've been made and, uh, and continue to. You know, we're not, we're not perfect. I knew that I had to go through the process. Coming from the mortgage banking industry of 38 years, I understand processes, so I was ready to get to it. I understood that I had to do it. But I didn't expect the level of pain I would feel, physical and mental pain. It was like a hurricane hit me, and I was in the eye of it. Every part of my body felt like something had been torn away, that my flesh was being torn away, and something had been torn away. And Nikki, God bless you. Mental and physical pain would hit suddenly like a bolt of lightning and then linger. I never knew when it would come. And some days I still, I still get hit. I could not breathe. I could not think. I could not walk. Eating was a bowl of peas and orange juice. Maybe cheese. That, at least I got the food groups in. There were days I crawled and my ears fell deaf from my screams. I was hearing a whisper, but I was so numb and my heart was drained and emptied out that I could not focus. I was having nightmares. I had been crying out to God, to Jesus, to help me, but my noise was so loud I could not hear. My heart was empty and I could not feel. When I was completely spent and quiet, then I was able to hear Jesus simply say to me, I'm here, it's okay. Shh, be still. Then he started one measure at a time to fill me up with his blood, repair my body. He's the healer, people. Amen. He heals. Amen. He never left me. We work together. You can understand that with grieving comes pain, but never know the true depth of it until you take a hard look at the cross. And that was something I heard directly from the Holy Spirit. And things started to change. He had me pray to him to keep anything evil from my dreams. I would hear knocks on my door, I would wake up, and he would put me back to sleep. He would remind me to keep my pain in perspective. Don't lose perspective, Leslie. I did not want to see anyone. I didn't want to be noticed. I didn't want to talk. I had to force myself to go anywhere. I had commitments. There were loving people I needed to be there for. It was not just about my loss. They'd lost him too. My mom mourned him. She and I mourned him together. My life had changed. Everything I did reminded me of what was, what was gone. Or was it really gone? That brought on a whole other level of the grief and understanding that. I literally, Jesus literally took me to heaven and back. Everything I did reminded me of what was gone, and remembering it was unbearable. About a year and a half into all of this, um, I started feeling that I had no connection here, no base, no footing. It was horrible. The loneliness and the missing was huge. I'd go back and forth like a ping pong, and I had entered a spiritual battle. You know, we're accountable to our actions, you know. There's a lot of stuff we do because we do it. Not because the devil's doing it. He doesn't have to do it because he knows we're going to do it. But I'll guarantee you, he will grab hold of you in your weakness, and he will twist something around that you never expected. So if you want to let him enter in a little bit and then let him do that, you're going to suffer the consequences of it. Then I hold, heard the Holy Spirit say, it's a stop on your journey. I have more for you to do. He was nudging me, uh, uh, he was nudging me the whole way. I remember having a retreat for our life group leaders at the house about two and a half weeks after Jeff died. Jeff and I were in a life group through his illness and a few days before he died we had our group at his bedside and we all watched him wiggle his toes and we were singing songs. He loved it, we wouldn't have had it any other way, it was huge. 
Sometimes I'm reminded that Satan describes himself as a window of opportunity that fails. And God swoops us up with a blistering wind and places us back down exactly where we're supposed to be. The problem with busyness is that when it stops because something broke, sometimes there's no one there to fix it. And others suffer in that path, in that wake of destruction. The misery of grief, these are some thoughts that, I, I pulled out some thoughts that were coming to me because I did a lot of writing during that time. The misery of grief must not last too long because it will change its face and become a lifetime focus on yourself. Then worthlessness and deep depression. Evil then has a foothold on you. The hope of Jesus and his joy must be woven back into you gently in order for you to survive. Everything you see is representing something you cannot see. And that was given to me by the Holy Spirit. Everything you see is representing something you can't see. I realize that there's layers to grief. It's like a peeling away of your old self and the bringing in of the new. During the race when the pain seems never to cease and your regrets of even the moment mount, pray, cry out. He knows your heart when you're weak and drained, when you're dizzy and faint. Rest, wait, and stand firm with confidence in him who created you. Do you hear that? He created you. He knows it all. He knew you before you were even born. The fact that he even wanted us to be born is a big deal. After all, when you die to this world, you gain heaven. If you rest so long, you become weaker and the pain returns greater than before. It is then you stand up quickly and be firm. Refresh yourself, become clean, rejoice in the miracle of wellness in Jesus that you may forever be in the sight of God. Um, I've come to thank God for the ability to grieve. And I learned to accept it as a privilege. And now I grieve in a different way. I grieve for all of those that don't get that. Jeff used to wake up at night in tears. And he was grieving those that did not know Jesus Christ. And I had a hard time at that time kind of getting that. And I got it. And uh, the Holy Spirit also said to me, get up, go to the window, see what I have for you. You will finish with grace and humility. There is much more for you to do just as you are. His grace is bigger than we can imagine. I, I, I was pondering, I shared it with Bill the other day. I was thinking about how God, God crawled up inside of Mary. God did that. He got in there to come out of there as a man and as his son, Jesus Christ. And then sent him to the cross and gave us the helper, the Holy Spirit. So that then we, when we die, could go home and live in eternity forever. If you could just stop long enough to ponder the bigness of all of that, it would really, it could change the face of a lot of things in this world. It's your turn. I got a bunch of stuff here. <laughs> Kinda, yep. I don't have any more yellows except for what didn't help me and what did. I also made a list of gains and losses. That's helpful, too. <laughs> I am going to offer Leslie to you, any of you. <laughs> it's easy to give someone else away, right? <laughs> It could be today, and Rose shared with me also when I was just wandering back there, that her father-in-law just died this last week as well. So um, 
after worship especially, um, maybe you just want to talk to Leslie and just, um, maybe you just want her just to hug you and you're welcome to do that. So I'm giving Leslie to you because God gave her to us and God has comforted her and carried her and that's part of what the word is about today. God comforts us so that we can comfort one another. So um, I'm not gonna ask you anything else unless there's something else you uh, still thought of that now you wanted to share. You know, one thing I'd like to say is that um, there's a lot of things that you can say to people that are grieving that don't, uh -huh. help, that don't help at all. And I ran a list of them down. <laughs> so these are the things not to say, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry for your loss. That's, that's on every TV show you watch. So I know the, the well-meaning of it is great, but it really kind of falls a little empty to someone that's in the rawness of grief, totally in the rawness. I mean, they're lucky to even be standing there. How are you doing? The first person that said that to me, I wanted to slug. How do you think I'm doing? <laughs> and I know they mean well. It isn't, it's, this is kind of a sarcasm, but there are some things you can just kind of be aware of. Um, what can I do for you? I, when your mind's blank, you have no idea. Absolutely nothing. And I think that sometimes cards, just a hug, a smile, good to see you is enough. Um, don't be a grief cruiser. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there's people that, grew, that cruise grief. They're looking to hang on to your grief because that's how they live, and it feeds them. Um, oh, you're going to be around a long time. You're going to live years. I don't want to hear that when I've just lost somebody. I, I'm ready to go home. Uh, healing takes time. Oh, that sounds way too long when it's brand new. I mean, must be die, die, it must be really hard to have him die around Christmas time. Now, I know, I, I know that would seem hard, but for me, Christmas will always be about Jesus Christ and Jeff. Yeah. Um, just think of the good memories. Now, right now, I really don't want to think about the good memories. I'm crying. I hurt. So those are just some things. I, just, I don't mean to be glip about them, but it's just something to kind of just be aware of. You know? So... We're standing here next to somebody who's, who's lost somebody they love. We're all tongue-tied and trying to figure out something to say. So what do we say? Nothing? I love you. There you go. How many sometimes, of you can say sometimes that? Sometimes a touch on the shoulder, a tug on a ponytail. Anything to know that you, you, anything. Because really the grieving, in a lot of ways, they're really trying to avoid you altogether. How many of you have ever been with somebody where you've thought of, I, I wish I knew what to say? You ever been there? Okay. So what did, what did Leslie just say you need to say? I love you. I love you. How many of you could remember that? <laughs> because hopefully you love that person, which is why you're trying to come up with something to say. It's why you're hurting alongside of them. And that's why all you got to do is grab a hold of them. I love you. See? Hopefully, Nikki, we helped some people in what they're going to say to you today, okay? <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to come with a sermon. You need to be the sermon. You hear me? to bless us with comfort so that we can comfort one another. The question that we're dealing with this morning, and for those of you who are guests, we're actually going through a series, and the series is some questions called God Questions that people actually have turned in to me. Uh, by the way, if you still have a God question that you want to turn in, you're welcome to do that. Uh, use the tear off and I will still try to answer and respond to your questions. But the question that we're dealing with today is, why am I still grieving? I know my loved one is in heaven. Why do I still hurt? One of the things that I have found is that for 
Christians that when they say goodbye to somebody that they love, that sometimes they've had a rather close relationship with those people they've loved. And that even though they're in heaven and no longer here, that the missing of them, the pain of their goodbye, may actually be more intense than for somebody who's just saying, there's nothing after life, so once we're out of here, goodbye. But for those who believe that there's life after this, there is actually maybe more even grief. And it's not about it being unfounded, it's about it being real. It's about love being sincere. And so when you say goodbye to somebody you care about, you're gonna miss them. And yet, understanding someday you'll see them again, it maybe even makes the missing them stronger. Because, because you want to see them again, you're looking forward to that, and yet there's this pain that's just very real. See, grief is a fact. The word that, that Paul uses here is a word that's also used in Matthew 5.4. It says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I'm on the slide, why am I still grieving? Do you have it or? Cool, thanks. Matthew 5, 4 said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's the same word that Paul used when he says that God will comfort us so that we can comfort one another. The word there is parakaleo. Kaleo means to be called. Para means alongside. Does anyone remember something called paraclete? The paraclete is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I'm going away so that I can send the paraclete, the paracleto, to come alongside of you, to be with you, to dwell in you, to inhabit you, to be there for you no matter what you're going through. I'm sending that part of my part of me, the spirit part of me, that you don't just have to get to go to the Holy of Holies. You get to be the Holy of Holies because God's going to come alongside of you and be with you. Amen? So that's the word here, parakaleo. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be parakaleoed. They shall be parakleted. They shall have God come alongside of them. Ooh. That's what you were doing for one another as you're greeting one another in those three minutes. You're actually hopefully learning something about one of the best things you can do when somebody's grieving is simply what? Come alongside. Parakaleo them. Be there with them, for them. God comforts us, 2 Corinthians, so that we can comfort one another. And how do we do that? With what we've received. God comes alongside of us, and as he gets there next to us, when then we see somebody else that's hurting and grieving and going through some kind of pain, we're able to come next to them, because God's next to us, get it? Maybe we sandwich them. I don't know which was the best way here. But, but we come alongside and we're able to give them encouragement. We're able to give them comfort simply by coming alongside. Here's the challenge. We need to be open to the comfort of the Lord. Now, I probably should share with you that there's some other pieces to this word parakaleo. It's, it, it surprised me when I was looking up all the usage of parakaleo that a whole bunch of times it was translated plead. Here's one answering one. Do you remember when the demons pleaded with Jesus, don't send us away, don't put us in the abyss, please put us in the pigs over there. Do you remember, you remember that story? Okay, guy's got a thousand demons in him. They're, they're talking to Jesus and Jesus is saying, you know, he's going to get rid of them. They, they kind of know that and they kind of, you know, what are you doing, Jesus? Please don't destroy us. That's parakaleo. Well, that's interesting. Pleading. It's actually about communicating this, this, this stuff from your heart. It, uh, here's another one. This is the one you don't, some of us don't like. It follows the same theme of Hebrews when it says that God disciplines those he loves. To parakaleo someone 
is to come alongside of them and say, I need to exhort you. It's what I've been desperately trying to do with some of us as a church. When we give in to disunity, when we give in to dissension, when we give in to deceit, we are doing what? We're giving in to sin. Not only is it harming and grieving, this is what grieves God, by the way. Not only is it grieving God, but it's wounding and grieving the body. And when we address somebody, this is why, this is why Paul starts out in 2 Corinthians this way, because he's going to talk about their sins for a while. This is the book, this is the letter that later he's going to interrupt with the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but they have power to break down strongholds. It's an interesting transition that he's going to make in chapter 10. And the last three chapters are going to be different than the first nine and all. This is that letter. He knows. In fact, you know, some of you think I should come, you know, and you don't think that I'm going to be tough, or you think I'm too tough, or you think I'm just a big talker. And he says, look, I, I got to address our sin. You see, to parakaleo somebody is to exhort them, to challenge them, to encourage them. It's not just to say, oh, poor you. It may actually be to say, okay, you need to stop something you're doing. That's the exhortation piece of parakaleo. Do you remember one of the roles of the Holy Spirit? To convict us of what? Someone else's sin. No. Isn't it better that way? Yeah. Come on. You know, <laughs> convict us of what somebody else is doing wrong. Let's, let's get them. Because that way we don't have to deal with our junk. <laughs> Translation of the modern Christian who's not obedient, who's harming the body of Christ, Amen. Yep. who's going against God's will, who's grieving the Holy Spirit. To console, to strengthen by consolation, to comfort, to exhort to encourage, to instruct, to teach. These are all the meanings of the word parakaleo. We need to be open to the comfort that God wants to give us, and sometimes that's somebody saying, come on, get up. <laughs> there were times Leslie needed somebody to say, don't stay here. Don't lock yourself away. And there were times we had to force her to come to our house and eat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> And there's all kinds of ways that we come alongside of that person who's grieving. Next is the question that the person asks, will, will I get past this pain? Will I ever get past the pain? My answer is yes and no. If your pain is because a child died, your child, even in infancy, or before birth even, that pain will stay with you, won't it? It can't be discounted, it can't be ignored, it can't be denied, it'll stay with you. So yes and no, the pain will get easier. It's what the doctor said, Bill, you'll probably have pain the rest of your life. For those of you who don't know, I had the fun of running into a tree, breaking three, three ribs, four vertebrae, and crunching up a whole bunch of inside stuff. <laughs> and it hurts. I mean, there's times I get up and I just, just standing up. Some, I tried to sit down over there a few moments ago, <laughs> and it hurt. Okay, pain's going to be with us. And, and when we lose somebody, we say goodbye to somebody, even though we know they're in heaven and that's a wonderful thing, yes, we still will hurt. So will the pain ever get, go away? Yes and no. Will you get past it? Yes and no. Okay, how many of you can remember a time you got really, you hurt really bad physically? Anybody break any limbs? Okay. Uh, anybody have any uh, deep wounds that, you know, were really hurtful? Okay, all right. All right. Uh, anybody have fun of surgery? <laughs> oh, my. Okay, that doesn't hurt, right? 
Doctors say it doesn't hurt, they, right? <laughs> okay. okay, how many of you can remember exactly how it felt? Uh, be honest on this one. Exactly? In other words, can you bring that pain back to the intensity? How many of you have had a 10? Scale of 1 to 10, you know, the 10's the high, okay? And, and one's low. If you, if you haven't been in a hospital lately, that's what the nurses are going to ask you. Okay, what's your level of pain today? And they're trying to figure out how much they're going to drug you. Uh, no, no, how much they're going to help you. <laughs> okay, so, so, so how many of you had a 10? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, can you feel a 10 right now? But you've had it. And you remember it hurt, but you really can't go back there. Thank God for that. Thank God you can't still feel the same pain, but you remember it enough to say, I don't want it again. That's what we need for sin, folks. <laughs> oh, my. Will I get past the pain of sorrow? Well, yes and no. But here's what Psalm says. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, For his anger lasts for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. I will grieve. I may really hurt for a time. And there's a night of, of grieving. And, and you heard some of that in what Leslie was sharing. There's a storm period. She talked about a year and a half there. She talked about a spiritual battle. She talked about going into really kind of a dark place and the danger of that dark place. But you don't have to stay in that. That will come to an end because mourning's on the way. And mourning is about us getting back to God. It's about us enjoying him in the midst of the pain we might still be feeling. Why? Okay, I get, um, need to ask you this question. I've been asking this all week and getting all kinds of interesting answers. They're all pretty much the same. John 11 says that I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. For he who believes in me will never die. And then Jesus asked the question. And do you remember who he asked the question to? He's talking to Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha's brother just died. Jesus did not come before Lazarus died. And the reason why he says he didn't come is because he's going to perform a miracle. He's going to do something special that's going to change the lives of the people there, including Lazarus. So he doesn't, so he doesn't come. He shows up, what is it, four days later. Lazarus is in the grave already stinking, and that means he's decaying, okay? Mary and Martha are there with the, whale, the professional whalers. And in that day, you brought in a whole group of them, and they just went, ah, ah, ah. And wherever Mary and Martha go, it's just, ah, ah. And it, I mean, just think about that. You got whalers everywhere you're at. You go, oh, I don't think that's very fun. Okay? But that's what they were going through. Okay, And here Jesus comes into this scene, and Martha comes running, Jesus, Messiah, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Oh, Jesus, I'm hurting. Martha, do you believe I'm the resurrection and the life? Oh, yeah, Jesus. Oh, yes, I know, Jesus. I'm confident you're the resurrection, and someday we're going to rise from the dead. Says, oh, no, I got a different one for you. There's going to be resurrection today. Okay, get the picture? Talks to Mary, same conversation. He says, okay, where is he? Take me to the grave. What's he going to do when he gets to the grave? He's going to say, Lazarus, come forth, right? Does he know it? In fact, standing in front of that grave, he says, look here, God, I'm talking to you, not so that you will listen to me, but so that these people know that this is you at work. Bring him out from the dead. Did Jesus know that Lazarus was going to rise from the dead? How many of you think he did? Knew it. Certain of it. Right? Then why did he cry? Because here he is. He's been talking to Mary and to Martha, and he's walked to the grave, and he's just about, I mean, this is like Christmas is moments away. This is like the this illustration I've been using. You know, your son or daughter just, or someone next to you, they just destroyed their car. They're fine, okay, just so we know that. They just destroyed their car. It's totally totaled. They're really disturbed about the fact. And you have a brand new, if they like this, four-wheel drive pickup truck. If they don't, you've got a Mercedes-Benz that just came off the press. If they don't like that, you think of whatever car they want, okay? 
And you got it sitting outside, but you haven't told them yet. And you're about to give them that car, but they're still sitting there, oh, I lost my car, I can't believe it, it's going, I'm never gonna get another one like it. And you know you got a better one coming. Okay, this is the picture. Are we getting close? Jesus is about to say, Lazarus, come forth. But he stops outside the grave, and what does he do? Folks, it says that he was torn, that he was deeply moved, that he was troubled in his spirit. And then it says, shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus. Jesus had a few tears. Jesus got a little troubled. Jesus was bugged. Son of the living God weeps, weeps, weeps in front of the grave where he's just about to call the man forth. Why did he weep? God bless you. Why does he cry like this? Maybe you need to know some more of the story. This is two weeks before the crucifixion. This is a week before he's going to go into Jerusalem for Palm Sunday. And the crowds are going to be surrounding him. And Hosanna, save us, God. I mean, there's going to be a big celebration. This is before he goes into the temple and clears it out again. This is before the trial. This is two weeks before he dies on a cross. Why is Jesus weeping? Doesn't he know he's going to rise from the dead? Why does Jesus weep? You get another hint to the, to the answer when you know what Jesus did the week on Palm Sunday. He's coming into Jerusalem. He's up at the top of the hill before he goes down into the valley of Jerusalem. And as he's up there, and he's coming in with all the different crowds that are coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. So there's people coming from all over the world, and they're all celebrating because they're outsiders from Jerusalem. They haven't been in on all the religious animosity that's developed because they're excited about him. They've been hearing about this guy, and we're walking with him, and they're putting their palm branches and their clothes and all kinds of stuff like that down because, you know, this guy might be somebody really special. He may really be the Messiah. And he stops as he's all this is happening and he looks out at Jerusalem and he cries. And why does he cry? Oh, my people. He says it this way, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Today, how would he say it? Oh, believer, believer. Oh, Christian, oh, Christian. Oh, oh, person. How long I wanted to pull you under my wings. And he weeps. And if you heard the message last Sunday, I said the reason why Jesus has not returned is because God says he's being patient because he wants no one to perish. Why is he weeping? Why is God grieving? Our sin and the rejection of a world out there that doesn't know him. And what's even sadder is I think he grieves today when a body of Christ doesn't go out into that world and help them know that Christ is coming again. So he grieves when his people dissent, they disobey, they lie, and it happens every time we're dissenting, every time we're gossiping, we're getting into lying. Every time we're resenting somebody else, we're going to share some lies. And there's disunity. And Jesus weeps. Father God, there is much that you want to comfort. There are people here today, you know, whether every person here knows you or not. If they don't, Lord Jesus, I know you're giving them an invitation right now to say yes to you to come into their lives, even though they don't totally maybe understand it. Maybe they've been rejecting you. I don't know, God. But right now, if you've never said yes to Jesus or maybe you've been saying no to him for something, I just want to encourage you, please take this moment to say yes to him. It may be, yes, I'm going to obey you instead of my own ways. It may be, yes, I'm going to let go of pain and stuff that others have done to me. I'm going to, yes, Jesus, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop resenting. Yes, Jesus, I'm going to stop the, the unkindness. Yes, Jesus, I'm going to let you live in my life like I've never let you live there before. Say yes. 
And when you say yes today, remember, God wants to comfort you. He wants to come alongside of you so that you can comfort one another. In Jesus' name, bless us.